Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get started. Please take a moment to ensure your microphone is muted. My name is Cadet Second Class Jared Bachman. Thank you for joining our roundtable discussion with Lieutenant Colonel Ruttenber and Dr. Landek. Colonel Ruttenber and Dr. Landek, we enjoyed your speaking sessions this afternoon and are looking forward to learning more about your role in developing leaders of policy and building warrior ethos. Many in the audience only had the opportunity to attend one of your sessions, so I'd love to introduce each of you for this session. Lieutenant Colonel Ruttenberg is the lead planner and programmer for inter-theater airlift and air refueling operations and the mobility and special operations panel. She also volunteers on the Department of the Air Force's Barrier Analysis Working Group Women's Initiative Team as an influential and authoritative advocate on topics that influence women's propensity to serve the Air Force mission. Colonel Ruttenberg received her commission into the Air Force from Air Force ROTC at the University of Oklahoma in 2001. She entered service as a communications officer and later cross-trained to become a mobility pilot. She has served in a variety of cyber, flying, and staff assignments. Lieutenant Colonel Ruttenberg commanded air refueling in support of operations Noble Eagle, Iraqi Freedom, New Dawn, and Enduring Freedom, flying over 200 combat sorties and more than 1,000 combat hours logged. She is a senior pilot with over 3,000 hours in the T-37, T-1, KC-135, and C-21. Dr. Landek is an associate professor of history at Texas Women's University, the home of the Women Air Force Service Pilots, commonly known as WASPs archives. She is a Guggenheim Fellow at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, a Normandy Scholar, and a graduate of the University of Tennessee, where she earned her PhD. Dr. Landek has received numerous awards for her more than two decades of work on the WASPs and has appeared as an expert on NPR's Morning Edition, PBS, and the History Channel. Her work has been published in the Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Time Magazine, as well as in numerous academic and aviation publications. In 2020, Dr. Landek published her first book titled The Woman with Silver Wings, The Inspiring True Story of the Woman Air Force Service Pilots of World War II. In addition, Dr. Landek is a licensed pilot who flies whenever she can. Since your previous sessions occurred concurrently, we are grateful to have the opportunity to hear from you both at the same time in this smaller scale, more collaborative setting. First, we'll dive into some questions collected from your previous talks, and then we'll open it up for live Q&A. To our audience, there are two ways to participate during this session. The first option is to raise your hand virtually to do this, click on the reactions icon below and select the raise hand button. For older versions of Zoom, click on the participants icon and select the blue hand. We will call on you to briefly unmute your microphone to ask your question. Please be sure to lower your hand when your question is answered. If you prefer to type a question, the second option is to click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and enter it into the chat. So let's get started. And Lieutenant Colonel Ruttenberg, ma'am, our first question is for you. You spoke in your main talk about the Women Initiative Team's work on removing barriers to the service from the perspective of gaining a national strategic advantage. What initiatives beyond addressing outdated height restrictions is the WIT working on? Good question. Uh, first, for those that don't know what the Barrier Analysis Working Group, the Women's Initiative Team is, which is a, a mouthful. Um, it was established in 2008 and uh, we have five teams within emerging six teams. Um, so we have uh, minority teams for Hispanics, uh, Blacks. Uh, the Women's Initiative team is one of the older teams, um, and we have one of the largest amount of membership. Um, so one of the things we've done besides remove height barriers for women and minorities to fly in aviation um, is we have a lot of different categories. So we have uh, medical issues for women being have access to health care. We have uh, initiatives for pregnancy and motherhood. Uh, we have initiatives for just senior leader education. Some of the things that we were able to collaborate on over the last year was able to um, pay for breast milk shipping to be shipped home. Uh, we're an initiative working, working on right now that uh, the Coast Guard has been successful at. Um, we also were very influential in having the Department of Defense recognize pregnancy discrimination as a protected class for gender in our military equal opportunity policy. Um, we're also working right now on issues that impact men. Uh, we find right now that um, the way the language is written in our AFIs about uh, primary and secondary caregiver leave after someone has 
uh, a child discourages the men from, um, or partner, uh, from becoming the primary caregiver leave, which is not the maternity leave part, which is the convalescent period. Uh, so we're working to uh, normalize that uh, men have equitable parental responsibilities and should not be denied to become primary caregiver leaves. And there's just a few of the things we've been working on besides the obviously biggest change, which I have heard that has not occurred at the academy yet. So I'd be curious here if anybody has any uh, feedback on that of the, um, the hair policy that allows women to wear their hair down now in a ponytail or a double braid or a single braid. Um, the first significant large scale change for hair policy for the Air Force in 70 years. Great, thank you so much for that, ma'am. And we certainly invite any member of the audience to ask any questions that they would have about the WIT, but thank you for that overview, we appreciate it. Our next question is for Dr. Landuck, ma'am. And uh, the, the wasps of World War II were created to give the United States a strategic advantage, right? Uh, to release men to flying duties overseas. And you talked about how the wasps have a great sense of pride in their work and that they had to overcome many barriers to carry out their mission. Can you point to some policy changes that might have fortified their warrior ethos and how that can apply to us as cadets and future Air Force leaders? Right, well, I think, uh, you know, kind of following the, the same ideas, the women had initially were limited in the type of aircraft that they flew. They were limited to only light trainer aircraft, despite the fact that the initial women had 200 horsepower ratings, they were flying 65 horsepower planes because nobody was sure if women could do it or not. Uh, and they were able to strategically, you know, get one woman in the cockpit of an AT-6, get one woman in the cockpit of a P-51 and prove that they could do it. And then they worked hard to make sure that it was obvious that a whole group of women could do these jobs. Uh, so it was that, that getting that one foot in the door and then pushing that door open for more women to prove that they could do it. So while one or two women did something, then let's train 13 women to do the same thing, the B-17 being that example. So that idea of you know, pushing and leading by example is what they would do with those single, you know, single opportunities. And it's like wearing your ponytail, you know, okay, this is new and let's prove that we can do it. And, and then let's lead by example. And that was a big part of what the WASP tried to do. Great. Thank you for that historical perspective, ma'am. We appreciate it. And our next question is for Lieutenant Colonel Ruttenberg. Uh, ma'am, in your main talk, you discussed how the outdated height restrictions uh, pose a strategic disadvantage to our Air Force and how the initiative to remove the barrier has caught the attention of Air Force senior leaders and even Congress, to my understanding. Uh, can you talk more about how the WIT is able to gain the attention of decision makers um, and how it decides which issues to address and translate into an initiative so that way those decision makers can, can make an informed decision? Right. We do a lot of um, crowdsourcing, so we don't, it's not just something personally that happened to me, but we find that if something happens to you, it's likely happened to somebody else. Uh, one of the things we did was we had um, an offsite in a couple of years ago when we got a large group of people, men and women, civilian and active duty reserve, um, all, all over the spectrum. Um, and we had them talk about what they thought the issues were. And we had a facilitator and we found that there's about nine issues that keep coming up over and over again, but everybody as individuals were thinking it was just them. So we were able to categorize that and then really like narrow in on those policies. And then we would find who those policy owners were um, for these types of categories. Like we talked about primary caregiver leave, that would be an A1 policy. And the metrics for height barriers, that's a kind of a cross um, between medical acquisitions and operations in A3. And once you identify what you want to fix, um, you can start lobbying and you can do that in numerous ways. Um, you can write articles, you can go on social media. And again, if you heard my last talk, don't go on a Facebook grant necessarily, but hey, an awareness to educate people. Um, and we will just call up literally senior leaders and ask to get on their schedule once we have a developed product, a developed idea. So you don't go there with a the problem saying, you know, I want my hair down or I want this T-Bass fix. We do a lot of research, um, present why it's good for the Air Force, what, but basically create a, um, a strategy that there's no way they can't say yes. Um, and then we go in for their buy-in and one by one, um, and then we uh, advocate for change. And if you don't have the network and if you're thinking about doing something like that, uh, that's why it's important not to go it alone. Um, anybody can join the Women's Initiative team. What's great is if you don't have a connection to a certain office, one of us probably does. 
Thank you so much, ma'am. We appreciate that. And our next question is for Dr. Landuck, and it's along the same lines. Um, ma'am, we've learned about how the WASP and their allies have had a history of working to change policy and regulations. And what lessons can modern leaders, the WIT, um, us as cadets, learn from how the WASP conducted their various fights to change policy and even the law? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think they're all definitely on the right path. And, uh, you know, the WASP would say perseverance. <laughs> you know, th this is a long fight. The, the debates about hair, you know, and the WASP, when they were in training, had to wear turbans around their hair because the commander of their training base didn't like their hair. Um, and height, you know, the women faced challenges in the different types of airplanes they flew, but they solved those problems by you know, getting parachutes to sit on and put behind them and prove that they could fly it even though they were short. Uh, and then I think all the way through to the 1970s, um, when the women were fighting for that recognition as veterans, one of their allies was uh, Antonia Chandler Hayes. Uh, and she was the assistant secretary of the Air Force. And she spoke on their behalf and said, look, if we don't if we don't recognize these women, if we don't, you know, honor them by, you know, recognizing them as veterans, how can we be recruiting women today to serve as pilots? So they, they used the needs of that all volunteer force and the need to increase numbers uh, overall as a, okay, well, you'd better treat the women you have well uh, and show that they have these opportunities or all these talented women uh, and others are, are not going to come. Why, why would they come if you're not treating the people you have well? And I think that was a tactic that the WASP used during the war and in the 1970s to gain their recognition as veterans. And I think it sounds like you all are, are using it as well today. It, you know, there are a lot of changes that can be made that are old rules. You know, the hair rule is so old and so, you know, I'm wearing my hair down. I'm a civilian. I can get away with that. But, uh, you know, this idea of why were these rules put into place to begin with and do they serve any purpose anymore? And if your goal is to recruit the most qualified individuals to serve in the Air Force, uh, then you want to remove those obstacles uh, that might be keeping them out. 